going to do that without my stopwatch when I'm talking. But thank you all for coming out this evening. I'm excited to share some of our research on water temperatures at salmon spawning sites, and in particular how snowpack and winter conditions might impact uh, salmon development. And I work for the Chugach Forest out of this office. I'm an interdisciplinary hydrologist, fish biologist job. If you know Ken Hodges, when he retired, they took his job and they kind of added a hydrology component and um, hired me into that. I was a fish tech here at the district for six or seven years before that. And so I was involved, I've been involved with the field aspect of this research, and then I did a master's uh, project that incorporated some of the material I'm presenting today. And uh, so I've been, it's been a fun project to be involved with throughout, throughout the process. Uh, I should acknowledge my other uh, co-authors. Uh, some of you will know Gordon Reeves. Uh, he's a research fish biologist for the Forest Service in Corvallis. He's up here frequently. Uh, he's really kind of spearheaded the research I'm going to present today. Uh, Steve Wanzell is another researcher for the Forest Service in Corvallis. And he's been pursuing this project since 2009. And then Nate Mantua from NOAA Fisheries in Santa Cruz recently has been joining us and adding some expertise on atmospheric science. And when we talk about water temperature, uh, the first thing that comes to folks, some folks' mind is this risk down in Oregon, Washington, Northern California of increasing stream temperatures, reduced water flows, and a real risk of extirpation in some of those systems down there as the climate changes because they're so far south and latitude conditions are already fairly warm for salmon and there's really some real concern that populations that are already on the ropes from other disturbances might be extirpated by uh, warming temperatures. But the question we wanted to pursue up here is you know, we have lots of snow and ice surrounding the Copper River Delta. Water temperatures are generally pretty cool. Um, might there be other changes associated with climate change that would impact our pop salmon populations? And maybe not so much of an extirpation risk, but a change in our population size or the distribution of salmon, because those are two very important things uh, for our livelihoods here in coastal Alaska. And the first point I want to make is that water temperature in freshwater systems, so any aquatic system for that matter, but I'm going to focus on freshwater here. The water temperature is really important all year round. And it drives growth in metabolic rates for organisms, including salmon. It's hard for us to, to put ourselves in the mindset of one of these salmon eggs, but um, if you, uh, I have a little example here too. If you're a little egg like this sitting down in the gravel, your growth rates, your metabolic rate is all highly driven by the temperature of the water that surrounds you. Of course, they can't control their, uh, their temperature the way that we can. Um, so as a result, really small changes in temperature can have really big implications for their metabolism and their development. So about, there's been numerous lab studies, but this is a summary of five of them from different locations. Uh, for coho salmon, found that you increase water temperature from 2 degrees to 5 degrees for coho salmon incubation, you can have a 15-week you know, of four, you know, going a four-month difference in uh, at least three months difference in uh, emergence timing uh, for those juveniles. So seemingly small differences in temperature can have a really big impact on development. And if salmon are developing faster, emerging earlier, this can potentially have an implication on their viability. And part of why that is is because uh, insects are affected by temperature as well. And so there's interest in, if our salmon are developing faster, emerging earlier, will there be food resources available when they come out of the gravel? Um, and so here, this is a study by Loyola University for aquatic insects. They modeled, a, they, they took insects development rates here in the Copper River Delta, and they modeled just a one degree rise in water temperature. And they have, a, they found a, three month earlier emergence with a one degree change in some of these insects. And if you're paying close attention on the last slide, you saw that the three degree temperature increase for salmon resulted in a uh, three month earlier emergence, and here a one degree. So, so we had the chance to have things uh, get out of sync or be synced differently than they are presently. So that's some of our concern with, with why water temperature matters and why we want to keep track of how, it, how it's changing as our climate changes. 
Um, and here are the projections for our area. These are from SNAP, which is a really neat website from University of Alaska Fairbanks, if you haven't checked it out. And in this plot, we have the months of the year on the x-axis, and we have temperature and Celsius on the y-axis. The, the line in the middle is our zero, or our freezing point. And the gray bars on the far left of each month are the kind of the historical condition, and then the next bar to the right is kind of present day. And then as you work your way out towards the darker red colors, you're getting farther and farther out in the future until you're about 100 years out. And these are the climate projections, so the 30-year average uh, of temperature that we're anticipating. And on this plot, I've overlaid a typical coho salmon life history on the Copper River Delta, where we have fish spawning in September to into December, typically. Some spawn a little later. The eggs are incubating in the gravel, off the right side of the graph, all the way around to the left here, through the middle of winter. And then the eggs hatch in May sometime. And then they're emerging from the gravel in the midsummer. Um, and so the point I want to make here in particular is if we look at the December, January, February, these are months of particular interest to me because we see that we're crossing the freezing point. That under historical conditions and present day conditions, uh, the mean monthly temperature is below freezing. And we're anticipating that to rise above the freezing point by about 2050 or so. And the second modeling project that the Chugach Forest uh, organized uh, predicted a 20 to 40 percent reduction in snow or snow water equivalent below 500 meters as a result of the temperature change and changes in precipitation patterns, things like that. So, so we're looking at warmer temperatures and less snow. And from a, a hydrologic standpoint, this has big implications because the form of our water makes a big difference on when it runs off the landscape, how it's stored and what its temperature is. And these are the types of things we're going to discuss today. Um, so there, there have been two, we're not the only ones thinking about this. There were two recent modeling projects, one in Cook Inlet and one in southeast Alaska, that uh, kind of hypothesized impacts to salmon at all their freshwater life phases. And of the freshwater life phases, they found that this embryo to fry survival life stage is, what, is what's going to be most impacted by climate change, and they attributed this to increases in water temperature and then increases in stream bed scour. So if we have more wintertime flood events, the gravel is going to be moved down the channel more regularly and the eggs could be dislodged from the gravel. Uh, oh, I should back up for a sec, but, but this was all modeling and uh, not many people are measuring these things across the landscape. Coastal Alaska is very big and remote, it's expensive to do these types of projects. Um, and so there's a real lack of data on, on hydrology in our area. And so to that end, we installed a temperature monitoring network in about 2009, and we slowly been adding sites. Uh, we collect year-round data, um, we collect it hourly. The loggers that we use, we measure it in the stream water itself using one of these, this little data logger, you just turn it on and it will record temperature at whatever interval you set. So we'll set them to record every hour, they sit in the stream, and they have a sealed lithium battery that will last five or six years. So you could just it'll hold about three years of data at a time. So we'll go, we'll download them, set them back out, and keep collecting the data. Um, and so we've been doing that three to six years. I think that's a little old, maybe seven years now. Um, we have 13 sites where we're doing, actually, we have 18 sites we're measuring the surface water. We have 13 sites where, in addition to that, we're measuring temperature down in the stream bed. So the idea is we want to know what's going on down where the eggs are incubating. Um, so we do that two ways. We have uh, these loggers that we just, we have a percussion drill type thing. We pour a hole in the stream bed and we drop these in there. And they just sit, so the stream bed would be here and the logger sits down there. And this is the same type of instrument. It just records temperature. And it can also last for five or six years. Um, originally, the first way we were doing it, we would take these um, pipes called piezometers, just a shallow well. There's a bunch of holes drilled down here that maybe you can't see. This is one that's been out in the field for years, so it's all rusty. But um, so we also pound these into the stream bed and then stick one of these loggers down in here so it sits down in the stream bed. So if you see these out in the delta, that's, that's what they are. We're trying to phase these out, these pipes out. We have very few left. 
we're mostly going to this method because no one can stumble upon it and see it, and it doesn't you know, disturb anyone's uh, fishing trip, or they don't see it and pull it out of the gravel and wonder what it is. So, um, so in, and I circled in orange here this uh, 12 sites, 5 water years. A lot of the, the graphs that I'll show are focusing on the 12 sites where we have the most data. Uh, because what I'm looking at is changes over time, and so the sites that we've only had out for three years aren't as useful to me as the sites we're going to find quite yet. Um, and, and these are just the 18 sites on the, the delta. We have about 40 sites across the Chugach Forest. And I should add, they're all spawning sites for coho salmon, and about two-thirds of them are also used by Saka. And then this schematic kind of tracks what we're going to cover for the rest of the talk. We're going to talk about how water temperature is influenced, by not only the climate and the atmosphere, but by the landscape. Um, and then what that means for incubation, duration, and ultimately for salmon juvenile viability. And you see the viability is also affected in this little diagram by the gray boxes, things like the food web and predation. And um, we'll touch on those briefly, but I'm mostly going to focus on what's in orange and yellow. Uh, here are those 12 primary study sites across the Copper River Delta. You can see they're pretty broadly uh, distributed. And we just we originally went to places where we knew that fish spawned and threw out temperature loggers. That was kind of our, our random, somewhat not random method. But um, we were really interested in where fish are using. And um, I divided these into categories. Uh, GW or groundwater, a groundwater mix that also has ice and snow in the headwaters. Um, these atmospherically sensitive sites with lakes upstream, and then just kind of a none of the above. And I think the best way to show those categories is in picture form. Um, so starting here on the right, we see one of these groundwater GW systems. That's 25 Mile Creek. Um, it's just an upwelling of groundwater on a glacial outwash plain. This middle photo was taken there. This is one of these piezometers that's pounded into the stream bed about this deep. And then the water comes up to about here. And if you look closely in the photo, you can see that we have water welling up out of the top of the pipe. So that there's about 10 centimeters of, of head pressure there where the water in the ground is more pressurized than the stream water. And so it's literally welling up out of this pipe. And that's what's happening in the stream bed at places like this, or Upper Ibeck, or Hatchery Creek. You have such strong upwelling of groundwater um, that uh, it's, it's really filling the channel and gaining a lot of that water within that reach. And this has implications for the temperature because that groundwater has been sitting underground for decades. So the temperature is really equilibrated to a little above the annual air temperature, so four to five degrees in almost all cases. And so it's upwelling at that steady temperature all year round. Celsius. Celsius, sorry, yeah, Celsius. So as a result, you have um, cooler summertime temperatures, you know, less than 10 Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but you also have this lower frequency of freezing in the winter. These are the places that you tend to see open water in the winter time. You know, sometimes you'll see it because of uh, mechanical activity of the water motion. But frequently at the little streams on the delta, you'll see it because it's a groundwater upwelling. And it just doesn't freeze because there's this uh, warm groundwater coming up. So we tend to think of these systems as cold, because when we're out there in the summer, they feel really cold to us. But from a salmon's perspective, it's probably best thought of as warm, um, because in the winter time, they don't freeze. This contrasts, oh sorry, well let's go these groundwater mix. So this is Salmon Creek, right? Um, Power Creek, Salmon Creek, Clear Creek are our three mixed sites. They have strong uplands of groundwater, just like this, if you measure it. Um, but they also have a lot of snow and, and small glaciers up in the headwaters. And they're big mountain valleys, U-shaped mountain valleys, so they also catch a lot of precipitation. So I wanted to divide those out because it's not just groundwater. It's a mix of groundwater plus other water sources that's affecting the temperature. But nonetheless, we see cooler summer temperatures and lower frequency of freezing. Um, and the third category is ATM plus lakes. Um, these are shallow lakes and ponds like Martin or Little Martin, uh, Eak Lake. And the picture, of course, is McKinley, but that's just for the ease of the picture. Because most of the time I present this, it's people who have never been here before, so I can get away with 
putting it on not on a real site, but you guys will, will recognize that. But anyway, um, same principle applies. It sits out in the sun and it bakes. It's a shallow body of water, and the water stays exposed to the atmosphere. And so as a result, we get warmer maximum summer temperatures, um, you know, up uh, towards almost 70 degrees in some cases. Um, and, but then in the winter, it tends to freeze, right? Um, and then by none of the above, these atmospherically driven ones, the temperature in those systems isn't really governed by groundwater as much as um, you can link it with other landscape characteristics, such as what the ele mean elevation of the catchment is, or how steep the catchment is. Um, and so you'll see warmer temperatures in the summer at these lower elevation systems, colder summer temperatures at the higher, and then vice versa with the freezing, which have more freezing down low which is a little paradoxical at first, but it'll make sense in the end. And these systems, this is showing like 20 mile area, um, but you know, we also have 18 mile places like that. It's muskeg over shallow bedrock, right, or till. And so the water is staying very close to the surface. It can't percolate down into the ground. So it's staying where it's exposed to the atmosphere, and that's why we're seeing that sensitivity. Uh, just, it stands for atmosphere, atmospheric sensitivity. Um, yeah, not Cajero Automatico or anything. And so here's another way of looking at these things. <laughs> anyway, a little joke. That's an that's, uh, ATM mistake. Um, so here's time series. We have two water years. Um, we have our air temperature on the top panel. A uh, water year, by the way, just starts in October, like the government. We start in October and we go through into September. And the idea being that way we have the winter snowpack and the summer melt all in the same year. Um, but two water years, uh, we see, and these are 18, the 18 sites on the delta, and we see that we have quite a range even in the winter, about four different degrees difference in temperature. And then look at the summer, we have a, I haven't added this up in a while, but a 10 degree or so range in water temperature amongst 18 sites. Um, and to hammer home the point about these GW or groundwater sites and these ATM or atmospheric sites, I superimpose a couple lines. Um, we see that the blue purplish colored line here in the middle is the groundwater site and it's very stable throughout the course of the year um, versus this atmospherically sensitive site that has a shallower type water flow where it freezes in the winter, warms up in the summer, freezes in the winter, Etc. Um, yet there's salmon in all of these sites. That's why we put the loggers in there, so they have adapted to these environments, right? And so that's what we're going to be getting to next. Um, first, let me back up a little more about the physical model. So this is one way we can we can look at these temperatures. This is air temperature on the x-axis, and each little panel is a different site. So there's our 12 sites. Water temperature on the y. And so if you regress here, we're just saying at five degrees, these are the different um, water temperatures at that five degree air temperature. And we can, so these are weekly temperatures from years and years and years, and all the gray points there. And so, you know, if we pick this panel again down here, you know, five degrees, we had a range of a couple of degrees of water temperature at that one particular air temperature. We do that for all the data and we run that black line, which is just the slope essentially, you know, kind of the average condition above freezing, for air temperatures above freezing. And the slope of that we call the thermal sensitivity. And you'll see here how it's steep up here and really shallow down here. What does that mean? Well, here's maybe a better way to look at it. Um, so here's thermal sensitivity, or just the slope values on the x-axis and all our sites on the y. And then we have these groundwater systems which have a 0.1. So that means that for every 1 degree rise in air temperature, on average you have a 0.1 degree change in, in uh, water temperature. And that contrasts greatly to these sites that have lakes upstream where for every 1 degree rise in air temperature we have a 1.3 degree rise in water temperature. So they're much, much, much more sensitive. And so that's quite a spread. And you'll see this in a lot of landscapes, but maybe not quite to this extent in some of the other studies I've seen elsewhere in coastal Alaska or down south. Um, and it's perhaps it's because we're putting these right where coho are spawning, we're getting up into small streams, and so we have a really strong groundwater influence. Um, also, just the way the delta is formed, geologically speaking, it's perhaps particularly conducive to storing groundwater. And then at slope rates, we get these upwellings. 
But for whatever reason, we see a lot more of these unsensitive streams here than I've seen in other studies other places. And so I'm going to skip breeze through this one pretty quick. But basically, we're working, I'm working on developing a model with the temperature sites across the delta where we can predict the thermal sensitivity, how sensitive a stream is based on conditions of its watershed. So things like how steep the watershed is, or the mean elevation, or if there's lakes upstream, or how big it is. So you take these things you could measure on a map, and then if you could find the relationships between them and temperature, you could use a map to predict temperature to some extent anywhere across the landscape. So that's what we're trying to do essentially in a nutshell. So that's some of the work we have in progress. But let's get more back into more exciting stuff here and talk about fish, because the biological implications of all this are really kind of the fun part. So I guess I almost half gave it away, but this will be a good test for audience participation of when do coho salmon fry emerge from the gravel in our Copper River Delta streams. And any guesses? March. March. June. May. June, May, yep. April. Good spread. I asked Steve Moffat, and he didn't really know either, so don't feel bad. But, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, uh, um, it's, he had a good guess, though, and your guys' guesses are all getting at a similar line of reasoning, which is that salmon are going to they spawn in the fall, they incubate over the winter, they're going to emerge when resources are becoming more available in the spring, right? If you're a little, these are pink salmon, but you can see how small these little guys are. Coho are the same thing. If you're an inch long, oh yeah, you can pass it around. If you're an inch long little salmon, you need to be able to start eating as soon as you get out of the gravel. So you're going to want that food to be becoming available. <coughs> and so Emily Campbell, who's a PhD student working with Gordy Reeves, um, did a coho project up here where she was measuring growth and diet from little baby coho and looking at how they were moving around the system and using sidewaters and main channel habitats and all this stuff. And one of the things that she did was she cut out a bunch of ear bones from a subsample of her fish. And in order to list through their ear bones, she uh, was able to grind them down. I should have refreshed on her exact methods. But basically, she optically was able to count rings uh, because these ear bones form in a fluid sac. So they grow rings just like rings on a tree. And we tend to hear these with adult salmon or adult fish where you can tell things like time of freshwater entry or things like that. Um, but for juveniles, they will form like a daily growth ring. So she was counting days. So she knew when she caught them, when she killed them, could count back days to when they emerged from the gravel, and then days to when they hatched. And then she back calculated spawn dates based on that, you know, using a temperature model, which is similar to what I use. And she did this for five streams on the delta. So this will answer our question of when they hatch and when they emerge. And she found that um, that emergence was nearly synchronous, typically in July. You can see there's a range, but still across these five streams, the range is very similar. And the median is somewhere in late July. And so this is really interesting that it's so synchronous across the landscape, because remember all those different, different temperature patterns. These streams are very different, thermally speaking, but emergence was nearly the same. Um, and it corresponded with when our insects were in most abundance, especially midges. And uh, there were also no significant differences in their size at emergence. They were emerging at very similar size in all these different systems. So then when you calculate spawn timing, it more or less aligns with what we see on the ground, um, where in these um, surface water systems like 18 Mile or Black Hole Creek, generally fish are spawning a little earlier. The groundwater systems, they tend to spawn a little later. So basically, uh, what we have is high variability in spawn timing but synchrony and hatch and emergence timing. Um, in other words, the fish have adapted their spawn timing to ensure their juveniles emerge at a certain time when resources are becoming more available. So this was during a cool winter, 2013. What, ha what happened in the last three years when the water temperature warmed up? Well, that's what my study was on. So this was this taken just a couple months ago out at Saddlebag, and this was the same point the year one year before. And um, obviously very different water temperatures and low elevation snowpacks. And so how did, what does this matter to the sand? Um, and another plot here, this is um, the water year for the whole period of record out at Mudhole Smith Airport Weather Station. 
and this is the October to May, so our incubation period temperature anomaly. So just take the temperature and subtract the, the mean, and then you get whether it was warm or cold relative to the normal condition. And the normal condition here was 1980 to 2010, or so that 30-year period. Um, and so we see that we have, it was very cold back when everyone walked uphill both ways to school in the snow. <laughs> and then it warmed up dramatically as the PBO shifted in the late 70s. And then it stayed pretty balmy, and you know, which as we probably know up here is good for salmon fishing in Alaska, and very bad for salmon fishing in Oregon and Washington. What's PBO? Uh, sorry, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Oh, so yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, statistical <laughs> relationship. Let's do it with the water temperatures and where there's warm air and where there's warm water and where there's cold water in the Pacific. Because our climate, we have this high variability, and a lot of it has to do with what's happening in the ocean because um, we're right on the coast. And so, so we really um, experience these fluxes on either the decadal scale, like we see there, or interannual. You see how it's up and down. I think Ken once said to me that, I've been here 25 years, I've never seen a winter that was the same as another one. You know, it's, it changes a lot. Um, and so I took these colored points on the right here, these are the last five winters. The two blue ones were cooler than average and had heavy snow, remember snowpocalypse, and then the next year was pretty good. And then the next three winters we've had no snow, this is this inset shows snow at the, uh, at the snow tail site up on the ski hill. And, uh, and warmer, in the, you know, anomalously warm conditions. Yeah, 14, 15, and 16 were all low snow in April. Yeah. The, the two here you see were much, much warmer, um, but um, it went early in 14 as well. I know that seemed like a lot of snow compared to the last couple. And so the, what the assumption we're working on here is this is somewhat of a proxy for what we might anticipate. Remember, we're looking at a few degrees warmer temperatures and 20 to 40 percent reductions in snow. So we might be able to learn something by looking at what we saw the last few years. So this model relates temperature to the incubation duration. It was based on um, lab studies where they developed fish in tanks at different temperatures and they tracked how long it took for them to develop. And they, have, they were able to do this with fish from all over the place and five different studies by different people. And the fit is very good with the real data. Um, and so I took it and I plugged in our October to May temperatures here on the x-axis and calculated out how many days. And you see it's nonlinear in shape, uh, which is important because you get big differences when you're down at these low temperatures like we have here. So here we see our four categories. Remember our groundwater and our atmosphere sites and the lakes upstream. Um, two periods, the red boxes are that warm, mild winters we've had the last three years. The blue boxes are the, the snowpocalypse type scenario. And this is days to fry emergence or incubation duration. And we see at these groundwater sites, there's a 14 day difference in the medians versus at these sites with lakes upstream, we had a 120 day difference. So instead of it taking 280 days to develop, development was modeled to only take 160 days or something like that. So pretty dramatic differences. And that's opia. And then if we look at the landscape differences, as this, these brackets popped up, this blue bracket, that's what Emily was observing, um, the result of that. But we have these big differences of, you know, between these systems, and so that difference has to be made up somewhere, and it was in spawn timing. So fish were emerging at the same time, but the spawn timing was three or four months apart. Um, and that's where we were picking up this difference in incubation. But look what happens in these warm years. It's nearly homogeneous across the landscape. So, um, so there's some really interesting change that would happen there. That's what we're going to talk about next. This just shows a nonlinear relationship. I think for the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that one. Um, so I like to think of incubation duration as the chain that links spawn timing to emergence timing. And so what happens if you shorten your chain? Well, one of the two ends has to move. And presumably what's first going to happen is that emergence timing is going to be earlier. Um, so this might be the case of that, you know, those systems of the lakes upstream where we, there was 120 days less incubation. Um, so the fish are going to be maybe emerging in March instead of June or, May, or April instead of July or whatever the case might be. 
Um, so what does that mean, though? That will depend on how they do when they emerge. Is there food for them? Can they grow? Are they going to survive? Are they going to prosper and flourish? Or not? Because fish are spawning over somewhat of a range of a few months in any system, right? So if the ones that are spawning at the middle of the road don't do well, maybe the late spawners do well, or maybe the early spawners do well. And then if so, this is all hand-waving hypotheses here, right? If so, um, then we would anticipate that um, maybe we would see a shift back. So maybe if emergence timing is still favorable in July, we might over time see a change in spawn timing where fish of these systems are spawning later, just like they do in the groundwater systems. This is how we ended up with this range of spawn timing in the first place, as the fish adapted to their environment. And so these impacts will really vary across the landscape. And I think this is something that we sometimes in land management take for granted that We'd like to think that climate change will do this, and it will lead us to all these streams because a crick is a crick on the Copper River Delta, right? But in reality, it's going to be very nuanced, and we're going to have big differences across space. And then something I haven't talked about yet is this: uh, also that size of emergence is highly temperature dependent. So if fish are, are putting energy into metabolism because it's warmer, they're not putting that energy into growth. So they'll emerge smaller and lighter. And that affects their ability to assimilate food once they emerge from the ground. So generally speaking, if they're larger, they can hold better in the current, they can compete better for food, they, their wider mouth can actually eat bigger food items, and then their, more, you know, their larger digestive tract can hold more food and assimilate more of it into energy. So this is kind of like the butterfly flapping its wings, where something that seems kind of small will have bigger implications um, when you start going down the pike. And studies in British Columbia in logged areas found that fish that emerged earlier, even they, it changed the amount of time they spent in freshwater versus saltwater. They, developed, they grew enough during their first year in freshwater that they, um, that they went to sea faster than they did before the logging. So there could be some big changes in their life history as a result. And and here's where you know, I'm sure you want to know what the answers are, and all I have is more questions. But you know, there could be some change in the viability, some impact in our population size or stability. Um, and then this, add a, this could also impact the, add the life history traits, so spawn timing, emergence timing, when they go to sea. These are all life history traits that the fish have adapted to their environment to some extent. And we could see changes. Uh, the sum of all of those, all that variability, is captured in an idea called portfolio effects, where if you think about salmon kind of like a financial portfolio, or if you have a diverse portfolio of a lot of different stocks, it's generally more stable over time. And so some universe, um, University of uh, Washington researchers have applied that to salmon, and they found in Bristol Bay, the same thing holds. You have fish coming back at, in July and spawning in September for sockeye and spending two years at sea or three years at sea, and all that variability makes them more resilient in the face of selective, of universal pressures. You know, so if you had some change in ocean conditions, say, you're more resilient and able to keep your population levels steady if you have a, a broad portfolio. So this gets right into that. If we start seeing changes in migration timing where adults are all coming back in November instead of coming back between September and November, we're losing some variability there and some diversity across the landscape. That, of course, would also have huge implications for consumers, including humans, right? If all the co-hosts started coming back in November instead of coming back over four months. So these are why we're interested in tracking these, these things. And so we are trying to fill in the details on the biology. Um, we have, uh, you know, we're collecting fin clips from across these same streams, looking at the genetic diversity in these systems, which will get their ability to, the fish's ability to adapt to these changes and um, in these different systems. Um, we are collecting otoliths from adult sand and looking at years in freshwater, years in saltwater, which there again gets into this life history question of how much variability is there in their life histories across the landscape and how might that change as temperatures change. Uh, I mentioned the water temperature modeling. Um, and then other ideas that we have in gray here that we haven't started yet, but we should probably do a better job at tracking our spawn and emergence timing across the delta. And um, common garden transplant experiments. So we could take fish from 
uh, these different types of streams and incubate them in common temperature environments and then you know, do a manipulative experiment where we compare how their development is or how they adapt to different um, climate regimes. So these are some of the paths forward that we have from filling in some of the information about the biology. And then I just want to show a few quick slides about SCOUR, because I mentioned it earlier. This is from my thesis work, but remember back on the uh, picture of the Sheridan area, I had the two big impacts would be changes in temperature, which we've covered pretty well, and then increases in SCOUR related to more uh, winter rainfall events. Um, and so the idea is, just like here on the Copper River Highway, if you have a um, you know, big storm event, and um, water shear stresses on the surface of the road, you know, you're eroding away material. And the same thing happens to some extent during big floods in your streams. And the concern would be if the salmon are spawning in gravels that then start moving away and the eggs get scoured out and go with them. Um, so this shows Alleghenic boat ramp, and you can see this is a, a debris line or flood debris. Um, from this, maybe the same event as those when the water was going over the highway, but you know, significant water force when the water is up high like that. And so I wanted to see if how our scour risk would change in these mild winters if we had more of these big flood events called bank full of flood events where the whole stream channel was filled and the water is spreading out in the floodplain. Because that's kind of the point of maximum energy. Once the water starts spreading out in the floodplain, it's being dis the energy is being dissipated. So it's kind of that peak stage there that we're really interested in. So this shows three streams where we measured the water level and, and discharge at uh, 25 mile, Salmon Creek, and 18 mile. And you see that 25 mile is that upwelling Spring Creek groundwater source and it's very stable. And these other two systems are much flashier. Um, this is uh, the discharge over time. And so then we measured some other things. We uh, measured the channels with the surveying equipment. And then we did these freeze cores. That's actually Rachel right there with the headless horseman there. <laughs> um, but this is uh, three pipes that you pound into the ground. And then you pump liquid CO2 into there. And it freezes the sample. And so you freeze this core of gravel. And you pull it up with a come along. And I brought them back to Oregon and sealed out all the particles to measure the different particle sizes. And so we took all this information for these three sites and plugged it in some, into some equations that some civil engineer developed by measuring these things out in the field and found that you know, this is the kind of the shear stress at, the, at, what, at that flood stage, so the amount of force on the gravel essentially. And then this is the critical shear stress, the amount that's needed to get the particles moving. And then the third calculation was then you get kind of an average scour depth. So you calculate out how deep that that's going to affect in the stream bed. And it's all based on the measurements that we took out in the field and then these equations that were fit to the, some other environment, and typically in British Columbia. And what we found was that our modeled scour depth was pretty deep in Salmon Creek, 26 centimeters, almost a foot. Um, and versus at 18 mile, it was very shallow. That one kind of surprised me, uh, but it's unconfined to the energy we were able to spread out. And then at the at, at Spring Creek, were you to ever get to bank full, you would have kind of an intermediate scour depth. But that, as you remember from the, the hydrograph, is unlikely because it's so stable, it's just fed by groundwater. So that would be a pretty extreme event. Um, and we kind of, this kind of makes sense when we think about it on the landscape, where we see fish spawning at Salmon Creek, they're up in the woods where there's a lot of large woody debris or trees down in the channel, because that material will hold the gravel and prevent it from scouring away. You know, this calculation shows if we didn't have that material, the gravel would just head on down towards the lower part of the delta. Um, and at, uh, at 18 Mile, you see them spawning all over the place, even though there's no woody debris in the channel, nothing to hold the gravel, they can spawn all over because there's no pressure scouring them out. And that's not going to change. It could rain all at once in the winter. It's still not going to scour. Um, and then at the Spring Creek, you know, you could maybe scour if it, like, you got a torrential downpour of three inches an hour right there in that one spot, but it doesn't seem very likely. So there again, you see fish spawning all over, and there's nothing to hold the gravel other than the fact that the water just never comes up that high. Um, and so it's really important to consider the geomorphology when you're assessing the scour. And maybe what I didn't explain well earlier was some of these studies have 
I've done this over the landscape, and they have these predictions for like 80% loss of coho because of scour. Like, well, maybe, maybe not. It's going to depend on where you are in the landscape. And here on the Copper River Delta, it seems like we will be less impacted by scour versus maybe, say, in Prince William Sound or someplace where the channels are steeper and you have a you know, more confined channel shape. You might see more impact there. Um, but I think, I wonder if the fish in our immediate area, there's enough winter rain events that they've somehow have had to adapt to these scour events in a lot of systems versus a place like, say, central Idaho, they're doing some of this work where rain events in the winter were very infrequent under historical conditions. So the rain on snow events that are causing big floods now might be kind of a new experience for their salmon soap operations down there. And so if we tie this all together really quickly here, so this is increase of temperature, ATU is just a fancy way of saying temperature, the increase of scour, these are those three sites where we measured both. And so at this shallow flow path site of AT mile, we have a high likelihood of more rapid development, increases in temperature, a low likelihood of increased scour. At this uh, hot, big mountain valley of Salmon Creek, we have a medium risk of increased temperature and a high risk of increasing scour. And at the Spring Creek, we have a low risk and maybe a low to medium risk um, in the scour department. And so we can start seeing how in these different systems across the landscape, the pressure is imposed by climate change might really vary. And so yeah, so unfortunately, we won't really have a one size fits all. Um, what, we, what we have going for us here is that we have really intact salmon populations, a lot of pristine habitat. So by protecting or, or maintaining that habitat diversity, odds are better that certain stocks will do better than others and we'll, we'll be able to maintain our population levels. That gets back into that portfolio effects idea. Um, also, I think it's important to remember that these effects could really be influential here in the winter time. October to May might be when uh, you know, climate change really makes its mark on coastal Alaska. And a lot of folks are in the research community are looking at summertime temperatures pretty exclusively. And we're saying, well, wait a minute, we have to pay attention to the winter too. And then um, this is one of Gordy's favorite things. It's a little bit of a mind bender. But his idea or hypothesis is that these, the most sensitive sites to climate change also the highest interannual variability already. So they're the places where we see the most disturbance and the most change already. So perhaps the salmon that spawn in those places are already well adapted to climate change because they have the most capacity. They've been dealing with change on a more regular basis. Contrast that to these stable groundwater systems. The fish return to spawn at a very similar time. There's no scour. The egg development rate is very similar. They have perhaps adopted a very specific life history to their environment. So a relatively small change in that system may have a bigger biological effect because they have less capacity to change. So that's one of the ideas we're really getting at with our genetics work and looking at the otoliths and the future direction work that we're doing on the, uh, the biology side of climate change. So that's what I have. Um, this is an ongoing project, so hopefully I'll be able to give an update um, sometime in the future. Um, we're around the office here. If you saw something that interests you and you want to talk about it more or look at a graph again, or if I didn't explain something clearly, uh, just up here on the third floor. So come find me. <laughs>
But we are interested in Sakai very much as well, especially with some of this food synchronization stuff, because they're feeding on plankton instead of invertebrates. So um, the environmental cues for plankton to be coming up out of the lake bottom um, could be very different than for the insects in the streams. Um, and so, yeah, that is something we're very interested in as well. Yeah, I, I was going to ask the same question about the coho because of all the salmon we have, the variability in the returns is probably the highest in cohos. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had million fish seasons out here on coho, and we've had seasons where it's closed. So um, it, it just seems like there's so much variability there already, and that uh, it it could give you some false um, readings or, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of things going on. Well, one thing a lot of commercial fishermen, there may not be any weight to this, has said is that, uh, you know, you, you get these fall events where we get a lot of rain and, and guys are freaking out because they're thinking now they're going to push up into these areas you know, the cohos will swim up into as shallow waters they can get. It's not going to hold water over the period of time that they're going to spawn. And you can have freeze damage or it can just dry up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if uh, maybe that's just a wives' tale. Maybe that's not really a consideration. But it just seems like for the 32 years I've been fishing that the cohos, I mean, they're one of my favorite fish, but they're heartbreakers because you can't count on them. Sure. And so the population, so, so I guess I was just going to say it would be interesting to, to contrast that with sockeye um, because those fish have been pretty constant in our area. You know, when fishing games seem, seem to get the are able to come up with a fairly decent idea of what the returns are going to be. So, you know, yeah, it's a neat observation, and yeah, it would be good to tie those in. And as you point out, I mean, these are very complex life histories. They're in fresh water, different amounts of time. They're going out to salt water, different amounts of time. And so we could have impacts on a lot of different life phases way beyond what we're looking at. So we need to consider it in the context of whatever else is causing variability. And, and one sure. last thing, even the hatcheries, you know, where they have a really controlled environment, mm -hmm. have had a really tough time raising coho. You know, they mm -hmm. had some really consistent years, and then they've had some years where they've just been total bust. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, I just, yeah. I'm that out there. Yeah, no, it is interesting. So, uh, what are coho smokes going to see? Um, you know, typically they're going out in the you know, May, June time frame, but when they're running smoke traps on Salmon Creek and stuff, I think Gordy was saying they were catching them into September and October and random times in the fall as well. Um, so I think that there again, there's probably some, um, some site-specific variability or individual-specific variability. Do you have any observations on that? Or? I'm just really curious. I go for the larger version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so are they predominantly all three-year three um, fish, one year in salt water? Um, oh, actually, I had something on there, too. The, uh, in the, sh the atmospherically sensitive sites, they tend to spend two years in freshwater. Really? And in the groundwater sites, they tend to spend one year and then get out. So you do see differences. It was on one of the slides. I forgot to mention it. But yeah, I saw, I saw that. So, so you're saying that, like, they spend two years in fresh water, and then and then one year in salt water. Do you remember Chantel? Was it one in salt then after that? Typically, or more? It tends to be more. Just one. Yeah. I did fresh water. There's definitely one in, in two years for oh. fresh water almost. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yes, yeah, so you'll see differences there for the coho in um, in freshwater residents for sure. And I'm not sure if all the, there was only one for the marine or some of them are two years. There's some other folks in this room might have a better idea of that than I do. I've been spending too much time. Digging in the gravel, I guess. <laughs> so when you say so, it's like eac. So the, so they spawn in the streams. They don't. There's, are there any lake spawners in? Cohos aren't lake spawners, are they? They pretty much um, spawn in the streams. 
Yeah, I would think it would be a very limited. It would be weird to find them spawning in the lake. There's certainly inlets, um, you know, in the inlet streams. So, so there, so are any of the, do you think any of the um, salmon that are returning to the, the whole EAC system or the coves are going to spend two years in fresh water or not? Um, that's a good question. I can look at um, Gordy's scales from Power Creek and see what the, because we've collected in Power Creek. Um, from Eak Lake, but not from some of the other trips. Um, I don't know offhand what he was finding, but I can look into that and let you know um, how long they're spending typically. Do you recall? Off your top? Marianne had a small trap on Eak, right? Marianne and Bishop. Um, yeah, so when they measured, I think they got H. They aged these snakes, but I'm not, I don't know what they found. Okay. I just have one more quick uh -huh. comment. Do, what, what's your opinion on <clears throat> the last few years when Hatchery Creek, well, when Power Creek really ran down Power Creek mm -hmm. Road and, and came down Hatchery Creek pretty hard? Is that, is that uh, prone to scouring there? Yeah, that would certainly, well, you know, the bankful elevation is going to stay the same, but you're going to have more time when you're exceeding that elevation, so you could have more scour. I would think that channel is unconfined enough. It's probably okay. Probably more of a concern would be depositing fine sediment off the road surface into the Hatchery Creek side, because the water's washing over the road, taking all that fine fill material and dumping it in the creek where it could sit. It, it definitely was there the last yeah. couple of years. I think that's more the concern there. You do see it in the temperature signature. I don't want to back all the way through the graphs, but you'll see in the time series of these big dips at Clear Creek and Hatchery Creek when the Copper or Power Creek are flooding into their channel, and, um, and you see the effect on the temperature. Um, but these are, remember, these are strong groundwater. That's a strong groundwater upwelling. So you have that so where the eggs are incubating, it's still a relatively stable environment compared to what the surface water is doing in the stream itself. So I don't think that mortality would you know, necessarily be a given, but it's certainly a concern with all that road material coming in there. And that upwelling, that doesn't bother, obviously doesn't disturb the eggs. No, they seem to, sockeye really seem to seek out groundwater uplowings, and here Coho seem to to some extent, you know, we'll see them using these sites. And as long as the water is well oxygenated, which our groundwater tends to be here, um, it's probably pretty good for egg development because it's such a consistent environment of getting gas exchange and, um, and keeping the temperature steady and flushing away any fine material. So uh, back near the beginning, you had the greatest uh, change in stream bed temperatures um, in systems that had lakes. Is that correct? The ones that have lakes upstream, yep. So this was like Little Martin Outlet, Cabin Lake Outlet, systems like Right, those are really shallow lakes. Yep. But what's, what's, your, what's your theory as to why there would be a greater temperature change in, in the gravel bed for those areas versus atmospheric areas? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Because you'd think with a, with a lake uh, and temperature changes, the lake water would, would uh, be less susceptible to... Um, a water temperature change uh, in regard to a major air temperature change. In other words, it would be more stable, I would think. We're at a big, deep lake, I would agree with you 100%. Okay. I think the point yeah. of the these are so shallow. Okay. They're very affected by the sun. And I think a big part of what we were seeing, we are seeing a lot of warming in May and April, yeah. is because we didn't have the ice cover. Right. And so you have this big black body all of a sudden exposed, mm -hmm. even as early as March last year, to um, our abundant spring solar radiation. So it's just heating up in the sun versus after snowpocalypse, you had ice floating around the lake well th in the May or through May, and it was ice cubes in your drink cooling it down. And so it's that big change that we were seeing there in those systems that was related to that. I'm curious about the, uh, looking into the future and the idea of the portfolio effect. Um, part of it is going to <clears throat> depend on the composition of the different stream classes that you have, the atmospheric and groundwater fed and uh, mixed, mixed systems. So if you look in aggregate across the delta, what, I guess in terms of habitat area or maybe even production of coho, what, what's the, what does the composition look like? Are, are most of them groundwater fed systems or do you have any idea of, of the composition? 
Sure. No, I think that would be a good thing. And when I talked about the modeling then across landscapes we aren't actually measuring, that's where we could start really delving into that too. Um, but we don't right. have good counts necessarily for streams. You know, the state is counting the delta as a unit, and right. we don't do a ton of escapement counts ourselves. And right. so it's a little hard to tie it out or piece it out by right. where these fish are coming from. But generally speaking, I would say that probably the majority of streams are these atmospherically driven ones. Mm -hmm. um, then probably secondarily, we have these small groundwater uplines. This is just my hunch. Third would be the mixed systems with groundwater, and then the last category would probably be the, you know, stream downstream from those big lakes. A lot of the spawning is happening above those big lakes, where fish are spawning in the inlets, and then maybe are rearing in the lakes themselves. Right. But your plot uh, uh, that had all of your 18 streams, you labeled two as true ground dwelling, and two as true lake. You know, and oh, so, well, yeah. yeah, and so your your distribution, you know, that was kind of telling you your distribution of where the fish are, um, I would say, as far as an answer to that type of question, that the majority of the lakes that you had were mixed, which, or rivers, streams, I mean, you know, and that makes sense, most of the streams here will have them mixed. Yeah, no, yeah, and then that's the question, you know, we just put them out places we saw fish spawning, we didn't do any sort of a rigorous attempt of saying, well, these are all the streams of different types, and we'll try to get equal numbers of them, but that could be an interesting thing to do, then we could get a better sense, but yeah, you're right, we have, and those two, part of, yeah, it's, um, part of it has to do with the time, because I only did the 12 sites where we had the most data, so we also, we've been putting out other loggers since then. So we might be able to pull in more groundwater sites in the future. Um, we have a couple out in Prince William Sound as well. Um, and, um, and so we might be able to get a, a little better representation of that. Uh, one more uh, question about the, the whole yeah, population uh, variability, I think, is a really interesting question and whether there's genetic uh, differences between all of these population. So are, are there any, uh, I guess, like even anecdotal uh, observations on the, on the size of the uh, fish coming in, the adults spawning? Are they different sizes or shapes? Or even egg si are the egg sizes different uh, among these different systems? Have you so we've, just, we've been measuring those things as well. We're taking the scales, we're measuring fish length. Mm -hmm. um, I worry though, it's, we don't have a rigorous design where we're going out and we're getting our fish sometimes all in the same day or over a couple of days and not really spreading out over the run. So we could have some effects of earlier in the run versus later. But certainly you see some streams tend to have bigger individuals, Power Creek or Martin Lake come to mind. And, some, and um, um, so there could be a few factors going on there with life history, but absolutely, that's the type of stuff Gordy wants to get into more with this biological sampling. And the egg size is a big thing because that's going to determine the amount of yolk that's available to be assimilated. So, if you, you know, so egg size is a huge factor in incubation duration. Well, my plot shows if you had an egg that was the exact same size and you developed it in these two different temperature regimes, these would be the differences. But if egg size is different between these systems, we'll really need to know that to assess the, addition, the differences. Um, so we've been we've measured we've done some measuring of eggs, and we're hoping to do some more, and even looking at caloric content and yolk. Um, um, composition, things like that as well in the future. That's great. No shortage of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Start going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> 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 <laughs>